Hi, in this video I want to talk about how I learned functional programming in JavaScript. Now why would you do this? That seems like a lot of work. While learning a new paradigm may seem like a daunting task, learning the basics, the fundamentals of functional programming will already improve the way you write code, so it's worth investing. Code written in a functional style requires less cognitive load to understand, so this will quickly make you more productive. In addition, the functional paradigm is used more often nowadays, so at some point in your career you will run into it anyway. Might as well already have the knowledge. I'm gonna talk about functions, currying, and composition. Let's get into it. So let's talk about functions. Functional programming tries to model most problems in terms of input, transform, output, which is mathematically what a function is supposed to be. This way, you can think of your program as a lot of tiny data pipelines stitched together. Functional programming will allow you to focus on the what versus the how. This is called declarative. Let's look at an example. Here I've implemented the same functionality twice, and in the first imperative example you can see I need to instruct the computer into how it needs to iterate the array, which will then allow me to do the actual operation that I want to do. In the second example we're using a higher order function, map, most people are familiar with it, which abstracts the idea of iterating over an array away makes the computer solve that problem in an efficient way, and we as humans can focus on what we want done, which is the actual function, the predicate we pass it. Another central concept is immutability, which is a fancy way of saying, once a variable has been created, its value shouldn't change again. This increases predictability, and thus it becomes easier to reason about code. A practical way to start applying this principle is to always use const instead of var or let, to never modify any variables, including the ones that were passed as arguments to functions, and including the contents of arrays and objects. Let's look at another example. I've got the same filter function implemented twice. This left example mutates the argument it was given, modifies it, then returns it. The right does not. Now on the surface, this difference seems harmless, but if you zoom in on the call side, you can see that the mutable example actually violates our intuition of how scope works. Input is changed after filter is called, but output is also generated. Actually input and output are the same in this case. What we would expect is that everything that is between these brackets, the boundaries of scope, is contained within the function. What happens in the function should stay within the function, but it leaks. If you look at the immutable implementation, you can see that a new array is created, modified, and then returned. This is an important difference, because at the call side, you can be sure that once a variable has been created, it won't change anymore. Next, I want to talk about pure functions. The more pure functions we can write, the easier our life will become. Again, because it's easier to reason about. This is also true in object-oriented programming. Pure functions are just gold everywhere. Let's look at the definition and some examples. A pure function has no other dependencies than its arguments list. A pure function will always give the same output when given the same input. A pure function has no internal state. Therefore, it is separated from its environment and it's memoizable, which means cacheable results, which makes it more testable, portable, and parallelizable. Let's look at some examples. In here I've got a very pure function. It just sums these numbers together. If you call it with the same inputs, it will always give you the same output. The function below it is impure. It is not referentially transparent. It gives you a different result each time you run it. It depends on the random generator from the operating system. Next, let's take a look at a class method, specifically the increment function. It has a dependency on something not specified in its arguments list. This, a reference to the instance. Every time you run this function, you will get a different result. Thus, it is not referentially transparent. It will not give you the same output when given the same input. In the next example, I've got a function that has a dependency on the current system clock. New date will generate a stateful object every time you run this function. If you would write a unit test for this, it might work today, it will fail tomorrow. The fix is simple. By specifying the dependencies explicitly as an argument, this function becomes pure. The impurity is moved to the call side, and this function is suddenly unit testable. Next, let's talk about first class functions. This refers to having language support for assigning functions to variables, passing functions as arguments to other functions, supporting anonymous functions, which all gives us the names of functions do not have any special status. A function is just a variable type. This allows for the removal of extraneous arguments, which you can see in the example below. 
If HTTP GET calls its second argument with only two arguments, these implementations are the same. This one has an anonymous function which only receives arguments and then calls another function passing those arguments along. It does nothing by itself. So we can immediately give the inner function to HTTP GET. It will have the same result. Next, higher order functions. A higher order function is a function that takes another function as argument or a function that returns a function or both. Famous examples are map, filter and reduce. They all take a function and a list. I've got an example of map down here where you can see that the first argument is another function. When I call it, it requires this function, it requires the array, it applies the function that I pass to each item in the array and then returns a new array. Later, I will also have examples of functions that return functions. So the first step in functional programming is striving for pure functions, making them declarative and immutable. This will already improve your code by a lot and will make unit testing much easier. The next big idea in functional programming is currying, which is the act of postponing giving arguments to a function. A curried function is a special kind of function. It can take less arguments than it needs and it'll wait for the others. A curried function keeps returning a function when called until it has all its arguments. And then partial application is calling a function with less arguments than it needs in total. Let's look at an example of manual currying. I've got a sum function that takes two arguments indirectly and then add them together once the second function is called. If you call this function once, it will return another function expecting the second argument, and only after that second function has been called, it will run the operation. In here you can see the first call will return another function with this five in here, which you can then reuse. So this is a variable that contains a function that if you call it, will add five to it and then return, which is what we do here. This can now be reused. In practice, you would use a functional programming library which implements automatic currying. Curry is a function that takes a normal function as input and returns a curried function as output. Curry is a higher order function. It takes a function, it returns a function, it operates only on functions. When you call the curried function with just one argument, it will again, like the previous example, return a function that has the five coded in its scope and expect the second argument still to be given in the second call. And you can call a curried function as many times as you want. Until it has all its arguments, it won't run the operation. If you call it with zero, it will still expect two. If you call it with one, it will expect one more. If you call it with two immediately, it will run the operation. And in the third example, even more extreme, you can call it with all three at the same time, with one and then two, two and then one, or all three at once. This is all equal for curry implementation. Currying becomes really useful if we work with functions that take the data as the last argument. I'll explain. In this map implementation, we first expect the function, then the list. The list is the data. In this prop implementation, we first expect the key and then the object that we're actually operating on. Prop simply returns the property value of a specific key in an object. If we have this array of objects with names in there, this code will extract the names from the objects. Prop is called initially with one argument, but since this is a curried function, it has only received its key. It returns the next function that expects the object. It is already coded to give the name of any object you give it. Map will in turn call this function that only expects one more object with all the objects in the array, thus returning the names as an array. And the last big idea of functional programming I want to talk about is that of composition. Composition is the act of chaining functions to create a new function, passing the return values from one function to the other, as if you would nest the calls of functions. This enables pipelining of data and functionality. It also enables point-free programming, which I'll get to in a second. I've got a naive implementation of Compose so that it's easy to understand what's happening. Compose is a function that takes multiple functions, only two in this case, and returns a function that when called, calls both functions, the inner first, and passes the result to the outer, and then returns that result. So if you're looking at this shout example, I have two functions I want to run on this data. I'm pipelining the arguments into the first function, running the operation, returning its value, and passing that to the second function, then running its operation and returning its value again. Compose does the same thing, only it supports multiple functions if you don't have a naive implementation like this. Shout2 when called will both exclaim and it will call to upper. Note that functions compose from right to left. To upper is called first, 
then exclaim is called. If you read this code, this can be confusing. Compose actually has a sibling function, pipe, which is exactly the same thing, but it composes from left to right. So exclaim would be called first in this case. Let's look at an example chaining more functions together. In here, I've got three operations that are being ran. Remember, right to left. So this first, this second, and this function is being called last. Compose takes functions and returns a new function, which we still have to call with the actual data. Let's walk through it. First, we're using our prop function again. Remember that it retrieves a property from an object. It is curried, we give it price. It will return a function that when given an object will return the price property from that object. Map is a function that is also curried. It needs a function being ran on all the items in an array, but it also doesn't have its second argument. We don't give it yet, that will be given later, once we call the function at the end of the chain. The second operation in the chain is that of running parse int on all the items in the array. Again, map is curried, we only give it its function, it still expects its data, which it will receive here, of course. Average is also a function, we don't give it data yet. So in order, we take the price, we run parse int on all the numbers we have. So in here, we go from an array of objects to an array of strings. This operation will take an array of strings and return an array of numbers. An average is of course a function that takes an array of numbers and returns a number. Note that Compose produces a function that you'll still need to call with the actual data at the end. This is a piece of point-free programming, the fourth point of what composition enables. Point-free programming is the idea of having these chains of functions, building functions and composing functionality together while not referencing the data. All of these functions are curried and therefore we are not referencing data arguments in here. There's no list in this code. And at this point in learning about functional programming, I observed something very interesting. Most language syntax features are not used anymore when programming in a functional style. Things like operators and loops, they're not as composable as functions. You cannot compose a plus sign or a dot sign, which is the property access operator, of course, for an object. Remember first class functions? Operators are not first class. This is why we've used the prop function instead of the dot operator. The dot doesn't compose, the prop function does compose, it can be curried. The same is for example for the lower than operator. If I create a lower than function that does only this super simple operation, I then curry it, then I can suddenly use it in my composition. I couldn't write an operator here that will have the same functionality. I would need to make this a function, take another argument, it wouldn't be point free anymore. This is another example of composition, only in this case we're composing the predicate function that we're giving to the filter function. Compose will return a function and it takes functions. The first operation filter will be executing on all the items in the array is taking the price property from the object. Then it will compare this with the lower than function. Remember that 30,000 is the A, the first argument in the lower than function, and the B argument will be supplied by filter which will be the price, of course, the property returned by the prop function. So in the functional programming style, we would rather use a function to give us the functionality of the less than operator because it composes. For me, these were the three most fundamental concepts in functional programming. It made me a better programmer because of the way I looked at cognitive load, testability, and maintainability. Code bases that are heavily rely on functional programming age well, so to say. And that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have any comments or requests for things you'd like to see, leave a comment and subscribe. Thanks for watching.